for ethics, yeah, who's going to talk to us about human autonomy and the governance of autonomous systems. And I'm not going to repeat the abstract because I'm kind of presuming that you all have read it. So Karina, on you go and you can share your screen with us and then, then we'll get going. Uh, oh, one thing I should, sorry, I should say the usual warnings. This will be recorded, yeah, and it will be made available on the Task Governance Node website. So if you don't want to be have your voice recorded or your video recorded, then put the question in the chat and uh, very welcome to put questions in the chat as we go along and then I'll try and do I'll try and uh, resurrect the order at the end more or less. So anyway, that's that's what I was, that's all I've got to say. OK, on you go, Karina. Great. Thank you, Stuart. I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Can everybody see the screen, the presentation? OK, yep. yeah. yes, so um, today I will talk about human autonomy and artificial intelligence. So I'm going to keep it a bit more broadly and not talk specifically about autonomous systems. But I think there is a there is a link to autonomous systems that is uh, that I'll explore in the course of the of the talk. And that is very interesting also about this idea of what what autonomy is. So the the goal of this talk is to basically to take first steps into the direction of how might we actually go about operationalizing principles of human autonomy. Currently, uh, we see them we see them a lot in the in the policy discourse. A lot of guidelines are mentioning human autonomy as one of their uh, primary principles. So I will talk about this um, right. Uh, so I will start with talking about the current policy discourse. Uh, before then going into a bit more detail about the question of uh, what autonomy is in the first place and how we can understand it in various ways. And then finally, I'll try, ha, take some tentative steps towards operationalizing these principles or what governance and policymakers and uh, those developing AI systems could uh, could think about when they are trying to operationalize these principles of human autonomy that we currently encounter almost everywhere. So when we look at the current policy landscape, we see that autonomy is mentioned surprisingly often and often also um, occupies a very prominent place. So for example, in the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI that I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, by the EU higher level expert group. Uh, respect for human autonomy is the very first of their four key ethical principles. The Montreal Declaration for the Responsible Development of AI also has it uh, on, on number two, right after well-being. They have uh, respect for autonomy. Um, AI systems must be developed and used with respect for people's autonomy. Uh, and autonomy is also very often emphasized in uh, policy documents that are uh, that are on autonomous systems, so that are specifically on autonomous systems. So here um, is a, on the statement on artificial intelligence, robotics, and autonomous systems. Also by the this is by the European Commission, where they uh, equally emphasize the importance of AI systems to respect, uh, sometimes protect. Uh, in some cases, even to promote human autonomy. So one curiosity is that when we look a bit closer about what this is supposed to mean, so what these uh, what these principles are alluding to, then we see that there is a, a large amount of heterogeneity between the way these principles cash out this concept of autonomy and also um, cash out the risks that AI systems might pose to human autonomy. So here are just some examples for how uh, what these guidelines or principles say the protection of human autonomy would imply. So for example, the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, right, that Protecting human autonomy means that there is no unjustified coercion, deception or manipulation of humans. The statement on, on AI robotics and autonomous systems, right, you know, protecting autonomy implies that humans have control over and knowledge about autonomous systems. 
And then um, Floridian Cowles and their unified framework of five principles for AI and society um, write that protecting human autonomy uh, implies that we are protecting human decision making power. And when we look at these and we try to think of examples of, for example, manipulation, but also control over autonomous systems, protecting human decision making power, these are all very distinct requirements that we are having that we are that we are posing onto onto the development of a of AI systems. So the goal is to figure out what is going on here and actually what does the protection of human autonomy imply in the development of AI systems. Autonomy itself, as a, probably everyone knows, is already a very ambiguous and a very difficult concept, not just in this policy context, but also uh, within philosophy. So I really love this. Um, I really love this quote by Gerald Dworkin about autonomy. So I'll just I'll just read it out quickly. So he writes, autonomy is used in an exceedingly broad fashion, sometimes used as an equivalent of liberty, positive or negative, sometimes as equivalent to self-rule or sovereignty, sometimes as identical with freedom of will. It is equated with dignity, integrity, individuality, independence, responsibility, and self-knowledge. It is identified with qualities of self-assertion, uh, with critical reflection, with freedom from obligation, with absence of external causation, with knowledge of one's own interests. It is even equated by some economists with the impossibility of interpersonal comparisons. So we can see that even within philosophy, there is a autonomies associated with this really diverse set of different concepts, and yet it is one of our most important moral concepts and um, it is not just within philosophy very important because it grounds all these different our different moral theories um, it is a it is a really a foundation of democracy itself uh, and it it is also very much valued in our society more so in western societies i should say although um although i think the modern accounts of autonomy uh, certainly are also valued by by other societies than the Western, the prominent Western philosophy philosophy. So I would like to now move on to this question. What is autonomy? And we just saw that working was pointing out all these different ways that we could cash out human autonomy. And I think one very nice way of or starting would just go with a very broad definition. So this is basically the one of the standard definitions of human autonomy. So we might start out by saying, you know, autonomy is or describes the effective capacity of people to make decisions of their own that are of practical import to their lives. And when we look at this definition a bit closer, then we see now, actually, there are two parts to this uh, to this definition. The first one is that the decisions that people make are actually their own. So this means that they are authentic in a, an important sense. So their people are having are making the decisions on the basis of authentic values, uh, um, of authentic motivations and beliefs. And this implies that a violation of human autonomy, for example, could be manipulation or addiction or deception, because in this case we would hinder people from or we would we would we would exert undue influences on people's values and motivations and beliefs and desires. A second way of understanding this definition is to focus on the practical import. Sorry, actually. This is like um, I, I just I just realized as an intro. Don't, it's, don't focus on the practical import of their lives, but actually focus on the fact that um, that people are are acting on the effective capacity of people to make decisions and the importance of them to be able to act on these decisions. So the external dimension of human autonomy focuses on the fact that while I make decisions. Um, I'm actually able to act on them and I'm I'm going to 
uh, be able to execute them. And here the requirements for being able to act on decisions are basic freedoms on opportunities. So this means, for example, um, this implies that there is no coercion, that there is no compulsion. Um, my freedoms aren't impaired in any way, but also that there are uh, that opportunities exist in the first place. So we can distinguish between this internal dimension of autonomy, which has more to do with the authenticity of values and this external dimension, which has more to do with the fact that action, I can actually act on these act on these values. And I just um, just for short, I mean, we can also instead of saying internal and external dimension, maybe we can talk about the authentic authenticity and uh, agency, which I think are more familiar terms for uh, those of you working on in computer science. So I'd like to just give a couple of examples uh, for how authenticity might be affected by um, by AI systems. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of risks. I mean, obviously, there are also um, positive ways in which authenticity or the internal dimension might be affected by AI systems. So one of the very obvious examples is online manipulation. And here, um, one of these uh, very famous cases is the emotional contagion experiment. So some of you might be familiar with this. Uh, was a group of researchers that wanted to know whether it was possible to, um, to have this emotional contagion on Facebook itself. So emotional contagion is the idea that we, uh, we mimic the emotions to some of the people that we are interacting with. So if I'm interacting with somebody who is sad, then I tend to get a bit sadder, um, at least if I'm an empathetic person. And uh, same, uh, same when people are happy, we tend to get a bit more, uh, a bit happier or you know, experience the happiness with other people. And so what the what the researchers did here, they uh, they tweaked people's timelines to show predominantly negative or positive content. And then they measured that what people saw in the timelines actually affected, affected their own moods. So people who saw predominantly negative content were then also more likely to uh, to post negative content. So this is a case where we do have um, we do have autonomy that's being undermined in the. Uh, oh, sorry, I should also mention that uh, people weren't aware aware that their timelines were being tinkered with. So here we have a case where autonomy is uh, negatively. So the internal dimension of autonomy is negatively affected by the use of AI systems. Another very interesting, also for us philosophers, very interesting case is adaptive preference formation. So here the idea is that once we are given a limited sex, a set of options, that we are adapting our preferences so as to match the set of options. And um, there has been interesting research for how, um, how recommender systems might be able to to affect our preferences themselves. So in this um, in this uh, very interesting uh, article, the authors show that people, when they think uh, some like a certain media content is recommended by recommender systems, they state that uh, they have or it affects their preferences for that content. So they um, if uh, in this case it's TV shows, but let's say Spotify gives me a list of songs um, or proposes a list of songs that it has determined uh, or that it has determined uh, that I, you know, I'm likely to 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 enjoy them, then I'm more likely to actually enjoy them just in virtue of um, of having them recommended by the system. So, I mean, they call they say this is anchoring effects. And here you could also think there is something about how the use of uh, recommender systems in this case affect, affects our beliefs or affects our, uh, in this case, our preferences in a way that one might argue um, is uh, detrimental to autonomy in this internal sense. Okay, I also want to give a couple of examples for uh, for the external dimension or um, agency, as a, as we call it.
So one thing that is uh, that is interesting when documents talk about this ex or talk about this external dimension is that it's often framed in terms of control and freedom. And in some cases, and this is something that I'm very happy to talk about in the Q&A, it's also unhelpfully framed in terms of uh, autonomy trade-offs between the autonomy of autonomous systems and the and human autonomy. So there is some there are some documents that uh, suggest that the more autonomous AI systems become, the less autonomous we we might become as human beings. And um, while I think this is uh, certainly not true, uh, the the idea here is that autonomy is cashed out in this uh, in in is is referring to this external dimension, to this control or freedom dimension. And there's also often an ambiguity with regard to what the risks are. So basically, whether the risks from AI systems are, are so that whether the risks are from AI systems themselves or whether we are actually referring to very general governance, organizational or political issues, for example, surveillance. So let me just uh, let me let me just discuss two of these cases, one um, where the risk stems from the AI systems itself and the other one where it does have to do with uh, general um, governance, organizational or political issue. So here we have um, uh, the case, uh, a case of AI coercion in a sense. So we have uh, we have reinforcement agents uh, or in this case, like two self-driving cars that are on the country road with Alice and Bob in them. So we have Alice in the front and Bob in the back. And let's imagine the cars are designed uh, in such a way that they go as fast as possible, but without taking any any risks. So they are they are going through the curves at a at a decent speed. Anyways, but because uh, it is important that there is still some that the drivers still have some sort of control over the car and also feel comfortable in the car. The, uh, there is a mechanism in the car that allows the drivers to brake. So drivers can brake if they think the car is going too, fa going too fast. And let us now assume that Alice and Bob are in each, like in, uh, each in one of these cars, and that um, that they are in this narrow, on this narrow country road where they actually cannot take, cannot overtake one or the other. So Alice in the front, Bob in the back. So Alice feels unsafe in the car and she she begins to I mean she starts she, she starts braking in, in, in curves because she thinks it's just a bit too far for her unless she doesn't brake uh, when Bob's car is too close because then she's also worried that uh, Bob's car might crash into uh, uh, into into her car. So in this case, so El, Mad El Mamdi um, et al. Uh, basically state that in this case, you know, it might be the case that Bob's car learns to drive very close to Alice's car in order to, um, in order to, for to prevent her from braking and thus slowing Bob's car, uh, Bob's car down. So the idea here is that the, I mean, yeah, it's it's like it's a very familiar safety issue that uh, AI safety issues that you that you'll know. But the idea here is that um, the the system learns to uh, coerce the human being where here coercion. Um, it, it, I mean, she's coerced in the sense that she's prevented from breaking by exploiting uh, the her her the fact that she has that she's afraid and thus often breaks. So the previous case was one where we uh, we saw that the the problem itself or the the risk to under uh, the risk of undermining human autonomy came from the AI system itself. In this case, uh, or in, in in that case, it was a um, reinforcement learning, and I think the risks are are well known with those systems. So it was more an AI safety issue, but there are also um, risks that are more indirect. So here it is more about how the AI systems are used. 
So in the former case, it was more the almost like agential character of the AI system that was a problem, whereas um, very often it is more the intention with which the systems are, are being used that might be detrimental to uh, human autonomy. And uh, in this case, to the external dimension of human autonomy. So surveillance is one of these classical cases. Uh, facial recognition technology can be used to uh, limit the freedom of, uh, of people or is already used to, to limit the freedom of people by for example, limit um, you know, uh, undermining freedom of uh, of assembly. So we have this in in various countries where facial recognition technology is used for something that we would consider um, not in accord with our basic freedoms and our basic human rights. Okay, so. For the last part of the talk, I would like to think about how we can actually start addressing the challenges to human autonomy. So I already uh, I made this distinction between these two broad dimensions, the one, the uh, the internal and the external dimension. And but now can how can we actually move on? And it's not so easy and it's, I mean, obviously it's not so easy. And when we look at the, um, this is an extract from the, uh, the EU's draft regulation where they do mention, uh, for in this case, manipulation. So they write the prohibitions covers, uh, so prohibitions outlined in this, in this regulation, covers practices that have a significant potential to manipulate persons through subliminal techniques beyond their consciousness or exploit vulnerabilities of specific vulnerable groups such as children or persons with disabilities in order to materially distort their behavior in a manner that is likely to cause them or another person psychological or physical harm. So they are addressing, addressing this um, problem of autonomy even though they do not mention the word autonomy themselves curiously. And then when we go a bit closer and look at, OK, so what are they actually doing or what are they actually proposing? They um, they list as yeah, in the first paragraph where they uh, lay out the details of the prohibited artificial intelligence practices. Um, they write the following artificial intelligence practices shall be prohibited. And they say it's the, the placing on the market, putting into service, or use of an AI systems, a system that deploys subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness in order to materially distort a person's behavior in a manner that causes or is likely to cause that person or another person physical or psychological harm. Okay, so basically we do have the, um, we do have a, a tentative prohibition, or I mean, this is a draft document as, you, as, you're, all, as you're all aware of, um, a tentative prohibition of AI systems that deploy subliminal techniques beyond the person's consciousness. So the question is, how would we possibly determine whether or not an AI system um, is deploying subliminal, subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness? Um, so when do we actually know whether something is manipulation or when something goes uh, yeah, when something is when 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 something is just a um, just a normal influence, we could say. I mean, we're all in a sense we are all subjects, and we are all products of our environments. So, how can we actually turn this into practice and uh, figure out uh, the set of conditions that needs to be fulfilled for something? to be um, undermining human autonomy. And I think here philosophy can actually offer us some tools. So let, let us start with, the, with authenticity. So how would we know whether in a certain instance uh, autonomy has been undermined in the sense that my, my beliefs or my desires were um, or subject to an undue external influence or to a distorting external influence. And within philosophy, there are two broad schools about 
what it means to be authentic. And uh, these are procedural and substantive accounts and procedural accounts consider an act or an action as authentic in virtue of the procedure by which a person has endorsed or identified with the desires or traits that prompt her actions. So here it is really looking at, um, for example, uh, reflection. If I reflect, I do a certain action and if I hypothetically reflect on this action, would I identify with this action? Would I um, identify, would I, would I think it is in accordance with uh, what we might consider our deepest self? However, however, we might construct this concept of, of deepest self. Um, endorsed possibly is like, a pro I mean, usually we, we do not necessarily endorse with all the things we do, but, um, but, 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 but still we might be able to think about that we identify with most things in particular. And these are the more modern accounts of, um, of, of human autonomy. In particular, if we reflect on the socio-historical context in which we are embedded. And this, these procedural accounts also make autonomy a concept that goes beyond the Western concept, beyond the, the Western context where autonomy is often associated with independence and um, of, also with male, uh, with a male centric thought. But procedural accounts allow us to have very different values uh, um, and to, so for example, you might be in a very different cultural context that we would consider, um, let's say, a very religious context in which uh, that, that might be unacceptable in some uh, within the West. Let's say women stay at home and, um, and care for the children and do not work. Uh, with procedural accounts, you could still consider a person living it being in that context and and endorsing it as autonomous because they they might identify with the tradition they may identify with their with their actions seen within that socio-historical context now substantive accounts on the other hand do not focus on on the procedure by which we identify with our desires and beliefs but they instead they look at uh, they they consider autonomy is a value laden concept. So they do put some normative constraints on the, let's say, uh, the content of a given desire. So for some philosophers, the desire to be enslaved could under no circumstances be counting as autonomous because in this case, um, even though the person might identify with this desire, um, we mean it is just uh, it is just not acceptable and autonomy is value laden in this in this sense. OK, now this was um, this was this was a little detour into the into philosophy, but what does this mean in practice? So I want to come back to this case of adaptive preference formation, because I think it's one of the most uh, the most interesting cases um, where of of uh, or maybe also one of the most ambiguous cases where we could ask, oh, you know, what does it mean for um, AI systems or uh, affecting our preferences? So the question is like whether and under what circumstances does, does adaptive preference formation undermine human autonomy? And let's take as an example um, that we're doing a Google image search and this Google image search promotes positive stereotypes about white women and very negative stereotypes about black women. And we could say that, uh, uh, you know, if, we, if we're exposed to these, uh, if, if we're exposed to these kind of images all the time, then uh, we might actually change our, I should probably say adaptive belief formation because here we're not talking necessarily about preferences. So when we now look at the procedural and the substantive accounts, we can see that with procedural accounts require us that um, we are able to we are able to reflect on uh, our actions and on our beliefs and the beliefs we hold and the values we hold, and so uh, a condition for these to be for a condition that emerges from these procedural accounts would be that our reflection on our beliefs and our desires must not be constrained by reflection distorting factors. 
So here there is very much a case to be done for transparency. So it links very much to also to other areas in in AI ethics and in the AI governance uh, governance course. Uh, so procedural accounts of autonomy requires that we're able to reflect on 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 our desires and on our on our beliefs. And um, if I'm I'm just subject, like basically unconsciously seeing these various stereotypes, then and not knowing why they're there um, or why I'm seeing them, then in a sense this is uh, would count as a reflection distorting factors. Substantive accounts, on the other hand, uh, require us to look closer at the content of what we're seeing. So here it would be. Um, these put restrictions on what it is we are actually seeing. So this is like more focusing on not so much on the transparency and explainability, but more on the content of what we're seeing. So in this case, it's uh, images that promote certain um, harmful stereotypes. So in the end, like looking at these, uh, the looking at you know, these accounts of autonomy allows us to distill out two factors. Uh, one is that uh, we need to enable users to uh, to reflect on the online content and in order to determine as well whether they identify with what they're seeing um, or with, sorry, whether they not with what they're seeing, but whether they identify with their actions. And um, the second factor is that it points to uh, the moral adequacy of online content. Again, um, a very large field of research, and of course, there's a lot of debate about what is um, morally adequate in the online content in the online context. So now I'm just looking at the time. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm good. So in the case of agency, so, so this was looking at uh, at authenticity and you know what we might be, how we might approach. Uh, the task of operationalizing uh, principles of human autonomy in the authenticity context. And uh, in the case of agency, we're looking uh, more at freedoms and opportunities. So here are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves is uh, what freedoms, opportunities and decisions might be affected by any given AI system? So this is much broader, um, both in the positive sense or in the negative sense both in the direct and the indirect sense. And then finally, as well, uh, we also need to have a much more, much more clearer discussions about what trade-offs are acceptable. So for example, there might be safety trade-offs when uh, people are allowed to take all the uh, certain opportunities or when people, um, people have certain freedoms. Okay, I would just like to quickly summarize uh, what I've been what I've been talking about today. So the first one, the first point I've been making was that the turning principles into practice is a difficult task uh, in general, but especially in the context of human autonomy, we just need to have a more nuanced debate because the concept itself is so ambiguous. And there are so many different other concepts that are just being thrown. In, like, that are being used under this umbrella term of human autonomy that we just need to have a much more nuanced debate about what autonomy is and uh, what the risks to autonomy might be. Um, I've distinguished between two broad categories of risks. So one of them was the unwarranted distortion of an individual's beliefs, motivations or decisions. So this was the authenticity uh, dimension or the internal, internal dimension of human autonomy. And the second one was the unwarranted limitation of basic liberties and opportunities. So this is the, the agency uh, dimension. And then finally, we need to do just much, much more uh, to identify the conditions that are needed to be fulfilled for an act to, uh, to count as autonomous. So we need to have much more conditionals like when when exactly does an, does, um, an, does an instant count as an instance of, of manipulation? When is it an unwarranted external influence? And these are all things that are um, 
these are all things that are just being brushed over in the current policy discourse and also in the current uh, regular in the draft for of the uh, the EU draft on AI regulation. And with this, I, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to your uh, questions and feedback. That's great. Good. OK, so we should all applaud yeah, in using the suitable, whatever suitable uh, method you want to use. And Alex, I think you're first up. You were uh, you were very, very, very quick out of the uh, out, out of the trap today. Yeah, so off you go. Yes, I want to probe this uh, concept of manipulation because I think it's just as hard to define benign versus malign manipulation as it is to define autonomy, which is, you know, they're, they're trying to provide a definition of autonomy in terms of manipulation, uh, but I think it's just as hard to nail down manipulation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I and looking, so there's good manipulation and bad manipulation, right? And you know, one or the other really depends on whether you're in a game of coordination or conflict with the system who's trying to manipulate you. So a recommender system can be really beneficial, especially if I don't know the hypothesis space of options available to me. Recommender systems can be utterly brilliant and in fact can um, uh, prompt me on uh, experiencing unforeseen options to completely revise my preferences in ways that I wouldn't have anticipated without the recommender system and it makes me happy, right? I discover some new composer that, you know, Baroque composer, for example, and I like Baroque music, I like Bach, what, whatever, right? That, that's a good one. Um, uh, Malign manipulation can also be done with a recommender system if they have their own agenda, which is hidden to you, and they are recommending things that, you know, are highly curated and highly edited to their own agenda, which is hidden to you, and you don't have, therefore, an understanding of the manipulative move, um, a full understanding of it. It's not transparent. So isn't the issue much more to do with transparency? What are the preferences of that system? And so that a user can evaluate whether their own preferences are coordinated or in conflict with that system. Right. And so being manipulated. Let me give you an example, actually, and it's an interesting one. I did these experiments on settlers of Catan on the effects of persuasion in negotiating settlers of Catan. So this is a game of conflict, right? Win-lose game. Um, and you, people negotiate with each other over restricted resources. So, uh, you know, there, there's no, there's sort of coordination because it's in your interest to trade with other players, but it's also conflict. And um, I was basically looking at the effects of moves where I offer you something you didn't ask for, but that I want to trade according to my own strategy. And, and accompanied with a persuasion move like, if you take this wood, you can build a road without saying whether that's a good or bad thing for you to do. It, it, or just the offer, I instead of, or I will give you wood, right? Without the sort of description of the option of what you could do with it. And actually novices were less manipulated than expert players. And I think that's because novices basically knowing they're in a game of conflict, default to Crowfield and Sobel. They think, blah, 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 I don't trust you, right? And it's a it's a signaling game of conflict, and so they just go, I ignore those moves. Whereas experts think they know better. Um, and so we're much more manipulable. And this is in spite of the fact that the agent offering these moves, on average, their trading strategies won, it would win against players. So if they get their way, on average, they're going to win. So even when you know it's in conflict, if you think you know more than you actually do, you could be more manipulated than someone who understands their ignorance. Yeah, I mean, so, so I think I think we have to be a bit careful about what we mean by manipulation. So I do think there is a difference between manipulation, which uh, refers to 
covert influence um, and persuasion, which might be rational persuasion. So it is exactly the difference between seeing a picture, you know, having two advertisements. The first one is a, I don't know, like a dishwasher and it gives me all the stats. Um, and the second one is a, a bunch of young people sitting around a fire on the beach and uh, drinking beer. In the first case, I'm, I'm presented with facts and I would say if somebody says, oh, I give you this treat, you uh, no, I give you, what is it? I give you a wool and you can buy, a, you can build a village. This uh, This is, certainly they have their own agenda, but it seems like they are stating the facts. Whereas um, manipulation itself implies a somewhat covered influence. So I do not think that, at least from the point of view of autonomy, manipulation is, uh, I mean, sorry, manip from the point of view of autonomy, manipulation always undermines it because it prevents you from, um, from reflecting and making conscious uh, or reflecting consciously on your actions and your... Okay, your so this is a narrower use of the word manipulation than I was using. I was right. into rational decision making, but it's much more appealing to a baser emotional level. Right, yes. But so I think maybe not on the... Yes, it. maybe... On the, on a non-rational level, that might be that might be it. N doesn't necessarily be emotional, but def certainly non-rational in the case that I've that I've been using it. But I do. So, so it's a bit like in the Brexit referendum, the Remain campaign talking about economic detrimental stuff, and the exactly and yes, the Leavers and, having pictures of yeah. Brits on all fours with a chain around their neck and saying taking back control i mean this is appealing to a certain to a certain anxieties and certain um yeah certain uh, emotions in the in the people that are much more yeah that are much more yeah exactly so that would be that i think would count as manip as manipulation but as you say and i think and i think you're completely right that this is uh, it is already hard um to determine what we when somebody is manipulated or not. So for example, just thinking of your example of the recommender system, I do not think recommender systems are, um, so actually I, I like recommender systems. I think it would be impossible to navigate uh, uh, the internet without, and uh, I think we need to be careful with them and where there need to be some safety mechanisms in place, but just receiving a recommendation would not, for me, not necessarily be an act of uh, of manipulation, just as when a friend recommends me a CD, I mean, certainly I have certain re reasons to to believe the CD. I would like, I, I would probably like the CD um, if I trust my friend. Just as when a recommender system uh, suggests uh, certain songs to me, that in itself is not a manipulative new move. Um, but right, having said this, uh, it is a very difficult discussion to be had about what counts as manipulation. And just looking at what kind of advertisement is allowed currently, I mean, just like mentioning again, when you go to the cinema and you see, you know, people climbing mountains and then uh, you see the picture of a car driving through the mountains or you, you know, see people having fun on a boat with and then a picture of a beer. I mean, this certainly is a manipulative advertisement. I think it's fairly uncontroversial that it is manipulative advertisement and still we have it on screen and we are exposed to it as consumers. So I think there is a long way to go to actually, and it might be well impossible to, to um, even for clear cases of manipulation to, um, to remove them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Burkhard, do you want to go next? Yeah, You've got your thanks. Hand up. Um, and, and thanks for the talk, really interesting. Um, I'm 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 probably even more cynical about the AI Act than 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 you. I, I don't think the uh, Section One prohibited activity is meant to prohibit anything, uh, or at least not not meant to prevent anything that any sane person would want to do in the first place. Um, 
So for me, the subliminal advertising, uh, the su sublim sublim subliminal manipulation, what that reminded me of was the, you know, the old Coca-Cola one image in, in, in a hundred sort of thing, which didn't work and was a big thing people were concerned about in the 50s. But no one who is sane would try anything like that again. Wait, what's um, the Coca-Cola issue? Uh, there, there was a story that Coca-Cola had put individual images of a bottle in a movie film every minute or so. So that people, without noticing that there was a Coke yeah. image, um, nonetheless subliminally um, got that. And allegedly, it's totally fake, but allegedly uh, the consumption of Coke increased after being exposed to these images. Um, <laughs> Uh, was a big thing even when I was young. <laughs> I'm feeling suddenly so old uh, because people discussed it even though it wasn't real. And the, the EU language seems to be directly taken from discussions at that time. Interesting. And and I, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm, I'm slightly more cynical. I, I think this is almost, oh yeah, there are things we actually prohibit. Um, so that, that's good for you. And then anything that falls under it, no one does. And then you get a long list of things that are not prohibited at all. But which, if the act becomes law, will prevent nation member states to enact their own more stringent rules. The main function of that act is to prevent member states to regulate AI. That that seems to be its function, not consumer protection. It comes from 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 the um, single market authority uh, part of the EU, not not from the consumer protection part. Um, so so. That, that's the thing. I think the notion of, of, of manipulation here is intentionally um, hard to meet and, and to differentiate. The, the one example that I thought of, and that was one thing we discussed when we wrote a um, report for the German Ministry of Justice, the consumer protection part, long discussions about that, is uh, in-game monitoring of behavior to maximize purchase behavior. So you are in an online game. Um, you only reach the next level if you're either extremely skillful or you play a lot or you buy one of these loot boxes. Um, and from the side of the game, it's important to not get so difficult and so hard that you drop out too early but also not make it so easy that you simply keep playing on your own without purchasing. And that can be very, very potentially very, very individualized at that point. So you are the sort of person who is quite happy to spend a pound 50 if they have to play longer than two hours. But if you have to play longer than three hours, you simply move on to another game or if you have to pay more than that. So that sort of tailor-made keeping you interested while enticing you to cut corners thing was the closest example to really subliminal manipulation that we could come up with. And still we decided that that was probably legal. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, that, that would be the sort of manipulation that, that I would probably think about as, as the closest realistic example of um, what the EU is describing here. And I don't think they even mean that because that would mean that they actually prohibit something. And as I said, I don't think the, the function of the act is to prohibit anything. That's uh, that's actually very interesting. And I'd, I'd be I'd be thrilled to talk more with you about this EU, about the EU regulation. Um, what, when I when I read this, this paragraph, what came to mind for me was more YouTube's recommender system, because there I mean, as uh, many of you will be aware of, the the discussion at some point was about how the the algorithm um, leads people into the spiral of watching ever more extreme content, of uh, watching ever more conspiratorial content. Um, and I think the I mean the platform itself makes oh, I think something between seventy and ninety percent of their of their um, of their I mean, of of the time people spend on the platform is um, mm -hmm. is through video recommended videos. So I mean, this is how the platform makes money as well. And they said, you know, we we're just associating, we're just using it as a proxy for um, user for user satisfaction. 
um, the amount of time they they spend on the platform. And so we're maximizing this. And so mm -hmm. the algorithm ended up having this ever more conspiratorial content. And to me, this seems like a very clear case of uh, of manipulation because people ended up watching these very and almost, I mean, in some cases, psychologically harmful content as this is, I think for me, this is the catch in the in this uh, EU, in the paragraph of the EU regulation where they talk about there must be physical or psychological harm. And then um, trying to, to define psychological harm probably is very difficult and it's very hard to prove whether yeah. somebody um, it, is... It's an interesting example. Our, our, we, had, we had some similar discussion. Our thinking was um, that would have to be content neutral in order to comply with other laws like free speech law, for instance. So the harm would have to be spending too much time on the platform, regardless of what the content that you then watch on the mm -hmm. platform is. So that is the manipulation element. You spend more time than you originally wanted or that is healthy for you. It's not the harm that you see misleading, radical, um, psychologically damaging stuff, that is just the collateral damage. That is not the harm that is intended or directly attributable to, to the software. But that that might be open. But yes, we definitely should 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 have some more talks about that. Would be very happy to. Yes, yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, so are there other questions? Hands up if you want to ask a question. Robin, you look like you might be about to ask a question. Yes, I, I mean, your, your, the, the title of your talk was um, Human Autonomy in the Governance of Autonomous Systems. So the word auton, autonom happens in twice in your title, but I'm just wondering how these two bits are linked, if at all. Um, uh, and and, and um, so, so can you talk about how autonomous systems may or may not be the same as what you're talking about in relation to human autonomy? And is it is it is it in fact useful to think to talk about? I mean, the the cases you've you've you've, you've mentioned are not autonomous systems acting autonomously; they're systems acting purposefully, and it's much more like 1950s Vance Packard hidden persuaders than it is about uh, uh, about Google Deep Mind. It seems to me, but 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 um, uh, what what you know what 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 how do we conceptualize autonomous systems? And 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 the concept of autonomy seemed to me to owe much more to to to, to Hawkins and Asimov than to what the people I know who are building AI-based systems seem to be doing. So I'm just even wondering whether the concept of autonomy in the context of AI is at all helpful. Yeah, thank you. Actually, you you got me there because I did change the title uh, from in my presentation to human autonomy and artificial intelligence and took out the autonomous systems part because I thought it might actually get too long if I start talking about um, autonomous about the concept of autonomy in the context of autonomous systems. But it is um, it is I think the way the word autonomous is used in the context of autonomous systems is typically used synonymous as um, operating independently from human operators. So, so the, the systems work independently, you can, can act independently from human operators. Sometimes, so Russell and Norvig, for example, define autonomy in terms of learning capacity. So the AI systems are able to learn on the basis of experience and then act accordingly. But um, there are, I mean, there are fundamental differences about how, what autonomy means in the context of autonomous systems, which really is, um, for one, not valuable in itself, whereas in the context of human autonomy, we are valuing, uh, it's a fundamental value. And I think, so it is a, no matter, it's both for, let's say, uh, sequentialism and for, uh, for deontic theories, like autonomy is very fundamental to to our um, and very very valuable. Whereas in the context of AI systems, autonomy is just instrumental to achieving some other goal, but we don't value it itself. Plus, the um, I mean to be really autonomous, and I think this was also shown in this discussion about what does it really mean to be autonomous and what set of of criteria need to be fulfilled when you know, for for somebody or somebody's actions to count as autonomously, you can already see how this is much, much richer a concept 
than how it's being used in the AI context, where it really is just used synonymously with uh, independence. And sometimes, I mean, I mean, it, it varies. In some case, if we just call it, if we just have it synonymously with independence, then a Roomba would already be autonomous in some sense in this very domain, narrow domain of application. Um, if we then add onto it the way we talk these days about autonomous systems and particularly in the AI context, we're we're including more of this learning component. But it is uh, it is very much uh, uh, it lacks the richness that that where the concept has in the human context, where it is a it is a value uh, in itself and it also relies on on cognitive abilities that AI systems, at least currently, do not do not have. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I agree with that. But uh, it seems to me um, much of what you were talking about was about manipulation. Of the I, there's an actor who has covert goals which are being pursued through a system. And in that sense, the autonomy uh, sounds a little bit more like, oh, the computer says no. Yeah. So so, so the imputed autonomy of autonomous systems is is unhelpful because it disguises agency and attributes agency somehow to a machine uh, uh, and uh, uh, I mean I don't believe I don't believe we yet have uh, 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 agential machines in that sense um, but it does it, it does kind of seem to be muddy the water of responsibility um, uh, and 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 so you see you don't see good you don't see good machine doing this so I just I just I'm just wondering whether we should abandon the the autonomous systems terminology altogether or or have another or have another terminology I mean I'd be I'd be I'd be thrilled if it was if it was um if it was uh, abandoned also because it invites a lot of um a lot of uh, anxieties about super intelligence and AI systems taking over with this uh, this idea of of really I mean we don't have really autonomous systems in the uh, yeah, they are always they are autonomous in the in the narrow domain. But I think it's hopeless to to wish that it's going to be abandoned. Just as we, I mean, as we use uh, other psychologically rich content concepts like learning and thinking in the context of AI systems. Um, the I think the term the terminology has is 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 now fixed. But I completely agree with you that we should probably abandon the the term. I mean, if we had the, if we had the the chance, we should probably abandon it because it does uh, it is misleading in 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 some ways. Okay. So any other questions? I've got one <laughs> that I want to ask, um, but various other people might want to ask questions so anybody else daria you look a little bit like you might want to ask one <laughs> um yes i did write in the chat like it's it's not really oh, sorry a i missed it yeah no no it's not it's not really a question it was just uh just curious what what your uh thoughts are i have the feeling them in the in common discourse when we talk about uh, influence on autonomy with regard to AI, we always we tend to focus on how can I establish my own preferences and my capacity to make decisions freely, which is an important point. But could we say that there's a difference if we talk about preference preferences and if we focus on beliefs, which is something that might even go deeper in the problems than how AI systems might influence autonomy, and I'm just wondering what, um, um, yeah, yeah, what your thoughts are on this. I, I, it's not really a question, just like something in my head. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe maybe I can I can interrupt as well because I was about to ask a similar question, which is is something like, um, in a sense, your your internal aspect relates to belief formation, yeah, and and. The external aspect relates to restraining acting according to belief. Yeah, so that it seems as though your notion of autonomy is very tied to notion of belief. Yeah, and so then that to to go back to what Robin says, that seems to say that that human autonomy is a very different thing from machine autonomy. Um, 
because then we'd have to impute beliefs uh, in machines if we were to think about those as autonomous systems. But um, I don't know. I mean, th those were so. So thanks, Daria, for bringing that up. Yeah, it was a thing that I'd had kind of rumbling around for a while. So I guess are, are you happy with that tie to belief, and and then then what's the consequences of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. Th I, I am very happy with this tie to belief, um, and I think deception also counts as. A, um, I mean, most philosophers would also agree that deception counts as undermining human autonomy because um, we are given false in for false information, and so we cannot act. I mean, some of the, I mean, I was I was doing some shortcuts to spare you some of the the you know the the like some further philosophical distinctions, but there are in order to. Um, for these internal dimension of autonomy, usually the way it's cashed out, you have a set of conditions that determine what it means for a desire to be authentic. But then you also have a set of conditions that um, that are required. So this would be, do you have the capacity for self-reflection? You have like some minimal rational uh, capacities um, and and so on. So it is a it is a very it is a very big machinery in trying to to figure out what the um, trying to cash out this term in uh, and giving a set of conditions uh, for what it means to be autonomous is extremely difficult. Um, so, so yes, and always does it require us to have this very complex cognitive apparatus that allows us to have beliefs that involves self-reflection and this consciousness in uh, in some sense. And this is why we are so far away from from having like really why the notion of autonomy in the system case is so different. But Daria, I think you had a different concern. I, I'm not sure I completely addressed your, your question. So um, is that, oh, are you happy with that response yes. or do you still? Yes, yes, I, I, I am happy. Because um, uh, obviously they're, it's, they're not two completely different uh, preferences and beliefs are, are connected. Um, I'm just, um, Yes, it's, it's just very, that notion of authenticity is very interesting. Because um, uh, um, I, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I just wonder what what does it mean um, in terms of, uh, what would it mean? Uh, but that's um, in terms of regulation, how do we protect someone, those kind, that kind of internal world? Because um, I guess it's something you, you can't really detect from the outset, but that's just... Uh, um, yeah, I think I think yeah. that's a good question. And I I mean, I personally would be in favor of involving more consumers in the discourse. So, for example, you have systems, you test them and then let's say the YouTube recommender systems. If you um, if a lot of consumers support, oh, we ended up watching these uh, strange videos and like I didn't even want to go there. I don't know how I ended up there. Then clearly this is an indication that there is a um, you know that something happened that was subconscious that they didn't want to so they didn't so they said i did actually didn't want to i don't know how i ended up there it is like an indication that they have been um you know, that they were manipulated in some in some way or the other so actually monitoring or encouraging okay there we i ne almost never self reflect on whether what i want or whether whether what i what i do is autonomous so all these, this idea of having the second order reflections on our beliefs and desires is almost hypothetical. If I were asked and I would think about it, would I then uh, would I then agree with them? And I think maybe we just have to do this explicit with consumers. And when we test systems, ask consumers about this um, or users, um, and yeah, let's say users, and um, and thus figure out whether. They do embrace what they're being um, what they're being shown, but this also requires, I mean, a lot more transparency than we currently have. This requires certain at least minimal standards of explainability, and uh, and so on. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. So maybe we're done. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I had a kind of follow up on that, that Karina, which was that. When you were talking, you know, the examples that you gave on the internal stuff that 
so the the kind of the examples around uh, kind of emotional contagion, you know, made me think about moral panics. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about historic in a historical perspective. Then moral panics have been something that it's a kind of intrinsic in some sense in in human experience. And then I was also thinking about in terms of the recommender work. Then if you look at say Tversky and Kahneman his work on availability in terms of, of uh, kind of decision making, then availability is enormously important. And in a sense, what recommenders do is exploit that. And so and those are kind of historical examples of, if you like, human belief formation or, or decision making support mechanisms that we use again and again. You know, we use these simple heuristics and we use um, and we do have this thing of 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 contagion, social contagion in some way that creates moral panics. And and so what I was wondering was whether actually really the issue that we've got is if there's a strategy to use these in a deceptive way, you know, so the, so I guess the thing, the, the Facebook uh, thing at the moment or the YouTube recommender system and so on, there, there there's a specific strategy to monetize or to use those human characteristics to monetize the behavior that, that you generate from that and whether that's actually really where the debate should be. Yeah, I think strategies probably have to have to at, you know, have to start at different fronts. One is like more about how the systems are being used. Um, so this is the intention that is behind using the system and uh, which would be in the emotional contagion experiment. Um, it was very clear how the algorithm was working and what it was doing and then other strategies and then also testing the algorithms. So I think in the YouTube case, I don't know whether they knew about this or whether it was just uh, they were the engineers were as surprised as uh, as as the public when they found this out. This would be more towards testing what the algorithms are actually doing in the context of of recommender systems in particular. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you? I don't know about the moral panic. What is a moral panic? A moral panic is where there's there's a particular instance, yeah, and and it's there's a, there's a kind of judgment or some kind of frame of judgment, and then it spreads across many many people, yeah. So the you know it's uh, that young people like are being exactly. that young that young people have been uh, are being brainwashed by the introduction of television, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for example, okay. yeah, it's a the kind of group think, yeah, and then then there's a. A moral outrage about it, yeah, because in fact it's going, and in some sense that has to do with deviation away from parental be belief sets. I mean, I, th I think if you look, if you look more broadly, kind of historically, then things like new religions, you know, so you look at you look at say, uh, uh, I don't know, um, things that are cults that that arise, that kind of the Moonies or something like that, that attract their that reshape the belief set of of younger people from from their elders then that typically will generate some kind of response yeah but but the younger people would say that their beliefs are their beliefs in some sense yeah and so there's a so the whole thing becomes very social i mean when you look at belief it becomes very socially um constructed i think yeah yes and, yeah. I, and I think that whole thing of looking at religious belief is actually quite an interesting one because you do have these, you know, you do have these uh, gurus who set up who kind of, if you like, uh, construct groups of followers. And, and, and that's happened well in advance of the Internet or, or anything like that. You know, it's, a, it's been a phenomenon for many, many years. I mean, you could say into prehistory. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And it's uh, I mean, as I as I said earlier, we are products of our environment um, and it is very hard to to also say what is permissible external influence in the formation of our beliefs and desires and values as well and what is permissible or in fact normal. And this is a yeah. And this is like in particular, as you said, with the context of, of religion and other cultures, other cultural norms that seem uh, um, you know, that, that that are not endorsed by, uh, let's say, our culture. It is uh, this is why this is why I think it is um, 
it is a good approach to start. I mean, it depends on what you want out of the concept of auto uh, autonomy. It also depends on how how does one want to use it. Um, is it, uh, let's say, I mean, the example I gave earlier of uh, women not, uh, you know, staying at home and uh, and and being very religious and not leaving leaving the house without having a man accompanying mm. them. Um, for us, I mean, a lot a lot of people would say, you know, these women are not autonomous. But then it depends. It really depends on your. Is there? They're certainly not independent. But neither mm. are we. We are very dependent on our social environment as well. And then it depends very much. Do these women have all the tools available to them to endorse their own being and their own actions? Or mm. so. And if they have them available to them and they reflect on their actions and they look at the cultural context, do they still endorse them or do they not endorse them? And otherwise, there is this risk of being uh, um, adopting a paternalistic attitude towards uh, other cultural contexts. Um, yeah, and, and in that context, I think the age is also interesting, you know, because somehow changing a child's beliefs to be at variance to those of their parents is somehow seen as being um, as judged as being as being unwarranted. Yeah, uh, in some way. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a, I think there's something quite interesting around that one as well. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thanks. That was great. Yeah. So yeah. we whittled down to the few, <laughs> the few now. So anyway, thanks very much, and uh, that was a great talk. Good thank you very much for, thank you guys. for having me as well, and thank you for the questions. It was really, uh, really interesting and thought-provoking. Good.